Good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak on too sick to transfer. Obstruction after gastric bypass vigilance is key. These are my disclosures. In case you don't know me, this is me presenting last year at Sages. This is a recent pretty sunrise from my home in Portland, Oregon. What I'm going to cover today is small bowel obstruction evaluation and treatment. Specifics of small bowel obstruction post gastric bypass. Who is too sick to transfer? I'll present an interesting recent case of mine and some malpractice data. Small bowel obstruction post gastric bypass. How's it the same? How's it different? What's the same in that the patient requires a thorough evaluation, preferably by yourself in your own institution? Conservative management equals surgery. Non operative management is not conservative. How is it different? Bypass patients can become rapidly thiamine deficient, and so if they are vomiting, they need thiamine replacement. The lab result takes days to come back, so you just have to go ahead and replace it, and you can wait for the result to see if you were correct. They have a blind end of their anatomy, the biliopancreatic limb coming off their gastric remnant, so they might not vomit with a high-grade partial small bowel obstruction or even a complete small bowel obstruction. And internal hernias are, of course, more common. Small bowel obstruction is quite common, accounting for 12 to 16 percent of surgery admits. You have to take a detailed history regarding their pain and vomiting, a physical exam for tenderness and their vital signs, lab evaluation, electrolytes, white count, lactate, fluid balance. They third space a lot of fluid and will be dry. They need fluid resuscitation. And the standard of care with regards to imaging is a CT with and without contrast. The goal of management of a small bowel obstruction is to avoid dead bowel. The main clinical decision making is, is it a partial small bowel obstruction versus complete? Complete obstruction can lead to bowel ischemia and perforation. A closed loop is a special category of complete with both ends completely obstructed and has a very high risk of ischemia, necrosis, perforation. If it's clinically obvious that they have a closed loop obstruction, you can go straight to surgery. If not, get CT. Who is too sick to transfer? Well, if they have signs of ischemia or sepsis, such as fever, hypotension, tachypnea, tachycardia, elevated white count, and organ dysfunction, such as altered mentation, low urine output, and elevated lactate. Now, of course, you can always operate and then transfer the patient, which is much better than transferring a patient with ischemic bowel, and then they arrive with dead bowel. The prudent and conservative thing to do is to operate. There's a lot of literature now on the value of oral contrast in small bowel obstruction being both diagnostic and therapeutic. There was a very good Cochrane review a few years ago on this. And the appearance of water-soluble contrast in the colon within 24 hours of administration predicts resolution of a small bowel obstruction with a sensitivity of 0.97 and a specificity of 0.96. In terms of treatment, there were six randomized studies which showed that contrast did not reduce the need for surgery, but did reduce hospital stay. Partial small bowel obstructions is where you can try non-operative management. Again, this is not conservative. There's one thing you get from me today. Bleed obstruction must be ruled out. No signs of ischemia. X-ray showing contrast in the colon within 24 hours. They do need an NG. It needs to be placed gently just past the G-junction, 40 to 45 centimeters. Kept NPO, give them fluids, monitor the ins and outs, and frequent reassessment on the surgical floor by the surgical team. Complete small bowel obstruction, of course, we're all taught the traditional surgical dictum. Don't let the sun rise and set on a complete small bowel obstruction, i.e. they need surgery within 12 to 24 hours. This is still a safe approach. Obstructions post gastric bypass can be caused by many things. Those general to any patient, such as adhesions or incarcerated hernias, 
and postgastric bypass are some things more common. Internal hernias, kink or strictures at the JJ, which can be associated with the visor, and intersusceptions. Who needs an operation after small bowel obstruction? There's a pretty good review by Michael Soros Group at the Mayo Clinic a couple years ago, and they looked at 100 patients with small bowel obstruction and CT. The radiologist was blinded to the outcome. Their hypothesis was that free fluid was associated with bowel ischemia and the need for surgery. The need for surgery was then determined by four surgeons based on operative findings and clinical course. And in the multivariate analysis, they found that four factors predicted the need for surgery. The history of vomiting, free fluid, mesenteric edema, and interestingly, the absence of a small bowel feces sign. They did not find that a transition point was predictive of recurring exploration. And of course, a transition point can be seen in a partial high-grade obstruction. The combination of all four of the predictive factors had a sensitivity of 96% and a positive predictive value of 90% for requiring surgery. Here's a CT showing free fluid around the small bowel. Here's one showing mesenteric edema from that paper. On to internal hernias. Seems to me there's been a progression from a um, retrocolic approach more toward the anticolic approach in gastric bypass. Anticolic is what I've always done myself the past 20 years. And there's less internal hernias. There are two sites for internal hernias in the anticolic approach. Labeled number one here is under the rue limb, sometimes called the Peterson defect. And number two is through the mesenteric defect of the jejuno jejunostomy. In the retrocolic approach, there's a third area through the transverse colon mesentery. There's a recent large review in surgical endoscopy a few years ago of almost 2,400 patients undergoing bypass over an eight-year period. It was anticholic and both internal hernia spaces were closed. And they found that 93 or 3.9% had reoperations for possible small bowel obstruction, presenting at a mean time at 20 months after surgery. And the causes for reoperation for small bowel obstruction were 27% internal hernia, 47% adhesions. A small portion of those were due to kinking at the JJ. And surprising to me, almost 10% due to intersusception at the JJ, which I've not found to be a common problem. Most internal hernias are actually chronic and relapsing, waning, on and off pain and vomiting and don't present acutely to the ER, but to your office. A few are acute and need emergency surgery. Unfortunately, a CT scan has a fairly low sensitivity for these, so you have to have a low threshold for diagnostic laparoscopy, which of course has fairly low morbidity. CT scans for internal hernia can be helpful if a mesenteric swirl sign is present. This sign also has a low sensitivity and but high specificity. Here's an image of a swirl sign around the SMA. Surgery for internal hernias. First, you're going to explore the abdomen. If you see obvious ischemic bowel or transition point, you can sort of go right for the money. If you don't, then you will need to lice enough adhesions so that you can run the entire small bowel. If there's an ischemic area, you can push it back through the mesenteric defect. If there's no obvious obstruction, start at the terminal limb and you'll run that backwards up to the JJ, and then you can turn yourself around and face the gastrojejunostomy and then run down the RU limb and the BP limb so you've run all the small bowel and found the defects. You need to close the defect. Occasionally, if the patient is very thin, which I think is a risk factor for internal hernia, you may need to close this uh, with mesh, and we have a video on this at this meeting. Early small bowel obstruction post gastric bypass is more concerning, is more likely to need operation. A recent publication in SORT found that 1.7% of patients develop a small bowel obstruction within 30 days of surgery. 59% were at the JJ, 79% required reoperation. 20% had an associated leak. Of course, obstruction at the JJ can lead to leak at the GJ. And unfortunately, 6.9% died. So this is a significant problem with high morbidity and mortality. 
There's a nice coronal CT image of a kink restrictor at the JJ. The pouch labeled P there, and you can see contrast going down the elementary limb. And the arrow pointing out the transition point and relatively decompressed bowel afterwards. Management of these, you won't find this published anywhere, but I have found that with these patients, the RULAM is supposed to, of course, lie on the patient's right. And if they come in in the middle of the night, and while they're being fluid resuscitated and we're waiting to see if they need surgery, I'll have them lay on the right side. And several times I've actually had the obstruction resolve. And I decided to try that because sometimes I would operate and literally just, it was a 15-minute procedure where I just flipped the limb over where it had kinked, perhaps add one suture, perhaps even not. If there's a persistent or high grade stricture at the JJ, then you may need to revise it or bypass it. I'm not personally had to do that. Here's a target sign of intersusception. Find there's a significantly high false positive rate of intersusceptions on CT. And so um, following the patient closely with vigilance is key. So here's my case. I had a 35-year-old female, went through all the usual workup prior to her bypass, including a sciatic valve, and she presented with a bowel obstruction at six months post-op. Past medical history included chronic anticoagulation for lupus anticoagulant, and she had had multiple spontaneous abortions due to that. She also had an anastomotic ulcer early post-op, had thiamine deficiency. She delayed her presentation to me because she was on vacation out of the country. And after the thiamine deficiency resolved, she had pseudo-seizures, which is a psychiatric problem. And when she presented with the bowel obstruction, she was 10 weeks pregnant and had hyperemis gravidarum, despite, of course, her counseling to not get pregnant in the first year post-surgery. So she presented with sudden severe umbilical pain, could not get comfortable, did have vomiting, had passed no flatus in 24 hours, was tachycardic, hypertensive, had an elevated white count, low urine output, a squizzly tender abdomen. And so I decided to take her immediately to surgery. And this is what I found. I had closed the defect. The suture was found there, though, to be pulled out of the mesentery, perhaps from her vomiting. And I was able to gently push that bowel through the defect. It immediately pinked up and closed the defect with a running suture. She felt uh, immediately better, went home the next day. Unfortunately, she did lose the pregnancy and is having ongoing psychiatric issues. But she and her bowel are alive. Briefly, a little malpractice data on small bowel obstruction malpractice claims. There was a 33-year review of case law on small bowel obstruction lawsuits. 156 cases uh, met the inclusion criteria for the study. There was a 61% mortality. Of course, if the patient dies, the family is much more likely to sue. 54% were divided, decided in favor of the defendant. The most common reason for litigation was failure to diagnose and timely manage the small bowel obstruction. 86% of cases with both failure to diagnose and resulting in mortality did result in a verdict for the plaintiff, and the median payout was $1.1 million. I do a fair bit of expert witness work myself and have some tips. They will seem obvious, but these are the things I see people err on. You should see and examine the patient yourself. Do not rely on someone else's read of the CT or someone else's physical exam. So review the imaging yourself. Err on the side of admission. If at all possible, bring them to your own service and institution. Err on the side of operation, have a low threshold for surgery. Non-operative is not conservative. In summary, don't wait, operate. Prevent ischemia. It's less than 30 days. Small bowel obstruction is usually technical and requires surgery. Start of the terminal ileum and internal hernia. Run all the limbs. Give them thiamine. A recent sunset from my home and another sunrise on the patio. So most importantly, remember, don't let the sun rise and set on a complete small bowel obstruction. They are too sick to transfer. Thank you very much for your attention.